mainstreaming the stories of unsung African heroines. There can be no doubt that African women have contributed immensely to the development of black history and civilization worldwide. Many have held positions of leadership throughout African history. These unsung heroines are depicted as queens, princesses, feminists, warriors, activists, chiefs, and leaders of men and movements that resisted the European colonization of Africa. The names of many of these women ought to be chronologically recorded in the annals of African history. This short documentary mainstreams the untold stories of unsung African heroines in no particular order. The docufilm and the accompanying workshops are designed to educate the general public on the significant contribution of black African women to the evolutionary history of black civilization. This new on Black History Month event is expected to serve as a reference point for black women history research. The virtual workshops and docufilm are streamed live on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. They are also available for the benefit of the general public on the Benin Trust website www.thebenintrust.com. Some of the notable heroines that are mainstreamed in this docufilm include Queen Nani or Nani of Maroons, Queen Idia of Great Benin Kingdom, Queen Amina Sukera of Zazao, Nao Zaria, Queen Ya Asantewa Asante of Ghana, Queen Nzinga Mbande of Matamba Kingdom, Taro Nanera of Emu Bay in Northern Tanzania, Harriet Tubman of Philadelphia, Kirgirwa of Rwanda and Uganda, Queen Anne Nzinga of the Ndongo and Ntamba Kingdoms, Modern Day Angola, Nathotep, the first queen of Kemet, ancient Egypt, Kalota Lukumi of Cuba, Queen Amosa Nefertari of Kemet Dynasty, ETC. Queen Idia of Great Benin. Queen Idia was the mother of Obayesigye, the king of Great Benin Kingdom, from 1504 to 1550 AD. She was clever, intelligent, and instrumental in the ascension of her son to the royal throne as Oba of Benin. When her husband, Oba Ozolua, died, leaving behind his two powerful sons to battle for the throne of Benin, her son Esigye controlled Benin city, while another son, Aruharian, was based in the equally important city of Udo, about 20 miles away. Queen Idia acted strategically like a general in the army, sending strong military aid to her son Esigye when a war broke out. This helped Esigye to defeat Aruharian, his rival brother, and claiming the throne of Oba of Benin. Oba Esigye became the 16th king of Benin. Queen Idia was uncharacteristically strong and courageous for a woman of her generation. She was a great warrior and she engaged in many battles during Oba Esigye's reign as Oba of Benin. This war greatly reduced the military strength of the great Benin Kingdom. This led to skirmishes and fights with neighboring tribes who felt the kingdom was ripe for the picking. Subsequently, the neighboring Igala peoples sent warriors across the Benue River to wrest control of Benin's northern territories. With the help of Queen Idia, Obaisigye conquered the Igala re-establishing the unity and military strength of the kingdom. In squashing these wars, strengthening and regaining authority and power, Queen Idia stood strong, giving military counsel and tactics to her son, as well as engaging her mystical and medicinal prowess to help in the battlefield. She was subsequently rewarded by her son with a formal title of Iyoba, meaning mother of the king or Queen Mother. This title was created just for her to recognize and celebrate her role in winning the war. 
This new title and position made her a political figure in the kingdom. It also included having her staff and separate living quarters plus allowance, the first of its kind in those times. Queen Idia is mostly known and represented as a warrior. Several arts and writings depict her both as a warrior and a woman, thus passing a strong message to women worldwide that they can be soft and loyal while at the same time bold, strong and courageous. The mask of Queen Idia was used to celebrate the Festival of African Arts and Culture Festac in 1977. The warriors she vanquished are depicted on top of her headdress in the mask. Ya Asantewa, Seka 1840 to 1921, Ghana. Ya Asantewa was an Asante queen from the Edweso tribe of modern Ghana. Her tribe people inhabited dense rainforests, now the central portion of Ghana. In 1900, there was a meeting between the British governor and some Asante chiefs, and Ya Asantewa was present. In the meeting, the governor demanded the golden stool of the Ashante people. After the meeting ended, she told the remaining Ashante chiefs that, Now I have seen some of you fear to fight for our king. If we're to be in the brave old days of old, the days of Oshay Tutu, Okomfo, Anoke, and Opuluware, Ashante chiefs would not sit down to see their king taken away without firing a shot. No white man could have dared speak to Ashanti chiefs in the way the governor spoke to you chiefs this morning. She then told the chiefs that if you men will not go forward, then we the women will. I will call upon my fellow women. We will fight the white men until the last of us falls in the battlefields. And so, in 1900, she raised and led a mighty army to fight the British colonial forces. The British army fought to seize the Ashante people's golden stool and conquer the Ashante people. Nonetheless, Ya Asantewa saw this as an effrontery against the strong and proud people of Ashante. The golden stool was a people's spiritual symbol of unity and sovereignty. Therefore, for it to fall into the British army's hands would have been akin to ripping out the hearts of Ashanti people. The British governor did not understand the sacred significance of the golden stool. According to tradition, it contained the soul of the Ashanti. Ya Ashantewa was brave and courageous. She would not allow her people to fall into the hands of the colonial invaders. The Ashantis led by Na Ya Ashantewa fought very bravely in the war. This war led by Ya Ashantewa came to be known as the Ya Ashantewa's war. For three months, Ya Ashantewa organized the Ashante army and led siege to the British fort of Kumasi. The British army was forced to deploy their entire military might consisting of thousands of troops and artillery to break the siege. Queen Ya Asantewa was afterwards exiled with 15 of her closest aides to the Seychelles where she lived till her death in October 1921. Ya Asantewa organized one of the last major wars on the continent of Africa which was led by a woman. Queen Nani of Jamaica Queen Nani, a Jamaican national hero, led the Jamaican Maroons in the 18th century. As a child, Queen Nani was kidnapped in her native Ghana, West Africa, and subsequently taken to Jamaica, where she was sold into slavery. She lived and grew up among the Maroons of Jamaica and some other African tribes. She learned their history and ways growing up. She was influenced by the Maroons and other leaders of the enslaved Africans. Queen Nani had the respect of her people because of her daring and courageous nature. 
She was also very spiritual and often used her spiritual skills in aid of her people. She was raised on a plantation, but she hated it so much and eventually she escaped it with her brothers and lived in the Blue Mountains in Jamaica. This was where she carried out numerous rebellions all over Jamaica. She was at the forefront and organized the freedom of enslaved Africans. She led battles after battles against the British armies and won. Her community, known as Grandi Nani Settlement of Nani Town, was often the target of many assaults and attacks, but it stood firm for many years under the Maroons' control due to the capabilities and skills of Queen Nani. Her efforts to free enslaved Africans led to the liberation of over 800 slaves who she also aided in the settlement and absorption into maroon societies across Jamaica in a period spanning over 30 years. The Queen of Sheba or Makeda. Queen Sheba was born in 960 BC and hails from what is now known as Ethiopia. She is also called Makeda in Ethiopia and Bilkis or Bilkis in Arabic. She is written about in the Hebrew Bible, Jewish texts, and the Quran. She is referred to as the ruler of the kingdom of Saba or Sheba. In the biblical account of the reign of King Solomon, she visited his court at the head of a camel caravan bearing gold, jewels, and spices. The story provides evidence of the existence of important commercial relations between ancient Egypt and Israel and southern Arabia. According to the Bible, the purpose of her visit was to test Solomon's wisdom by asking him to solve several riddles. Roger J. A. describes her in his book, Great Men of Color, thus, Out of the mists of 3,000 years emerges this beautiful story of an African queen who, attracted by the fame of a Judean monarch, made a long journey to see him. The Queen of Sheba appears as a prominent figure in the Kebra Nagast, Glory of God, the Ethiopian national epic and foundation story. This tradition corroborates the story in the Bible, which states that she visited Solomon's court after hearing about his wisdom. She stayed and learned from him for six months. Furthermore, on the night of her visit, King Solomon slept with her. She became pregnant and bore King Solomon a son called Menelik and was made king by his father. He found the royal Solomonic dynasty of Ethiopia, which ruled until, until the position of Helis Selesi I in 1974. Some accounts have mentioned that Queen Sheba reigned over Sheba and Arabia as well as Ethiopia and her capital was Debra Makeda, which she built for herself. To date, there exists in Ethiopia's Church of Aksum a copy of what is known as the Tables of Law that Solomon gave to Menelik I. Queen Ndate Yala Mboj, Senegal. Ndate Yala Mboj was the last great linge or queen crowned on October 1, 1846 in Ndar, the capital of the Walo Kingdom now known as St. Louis, located in northwest Senegal. In 1855, the Linger Fatim Yama faced Faid Herbe, army of 15,000 fully armed men with her army of fierce women warriors to prevent her kingdom's colonization. Ashamed of their defeat, the Moors returned to deal a final blow. In a later battle, Fatim Yama was outnumbered and outpowered. De Linger and her companions decided to burn themselves alive rather than be dishonored. However, before doing so, Fatim Yama helps her two daughters escape in order to continue her legacy. These daughters, Njeum Beyut and Ndate Yala, were educated as warriors and later ruled the kingdom. Queen Ndate Yala Mbod succeeded her sister, Queen Njeum Beyut Mbod. 
she became the leader of the Walo Kingdom's great army that fought against invasion and colonization by the Moors. Mbot was a symbol of resistance against French colonialism during her life and afterwards. During the second year of her reign, the governor granted a free passage of the Saracole people, also called Soninke, and this was followed by strong opposition. She resisted the Moors' deliberate encroachment on her territory and fought against the French colonialist army led by General Louis Feidhabe. This culminated in over 10 years resistance against the French colonization. She remained strong and resolute in the face of defeat and the capture of her son. Ndate motivated her followers by saying the following to her principal dignitaries while enemy troops were invading her kingdom. Today, we are invaded by the conquerors. Our army is in disarray. The tides of the Walo, as brave warriors as they are, have almost all fallen under the enemy's bullets. The invader is stronger than us, I know. But should we abandon the Walo to foreign hands? Ndate Yala Mbod, along with several other African heroines, played a crucial role in the struggle for African liberation. This heroine helped the French to recognize her sisters as full citizens some decades later. Her bravery has been immortalized by oral historians, also known as griots, and she remains a symbol of female empowerment. Queen Ndate Yala Mbod died in Dagana, and the statue that was erected in her honor still stands to date. Priestesses Mohumusa and Kaigirwa. Mohumusa and Kaigirwa were two feared and revered East African Nyabingi leaders and priestesses. These priestesses were very powerful and highly influential in Rwanda and Uganda from 1850 to 1950. In 1911, the priestess Muhumusa made a declaration that she would drive out the Europeans and that the bullets of the Wazungu would turn to water against her. Such was her power, bravery and courage. The British saw this as witchcraft and passed the 1912 Witchcraft Act in direct response to the political effectiveness of this spiritually based resistance movement. Muhumusa became the first in line of rebel priestesses who fought bravely against the colonial control of East Africa. She led armed resistance against German colonialists but was captured and imprisoned by the British official in Kampala, Uganda from 1913 to her death in 1945. She continued to be a figure of inspiration and motivation for her people long after her imprisonment and many people continue to follow her and carry on her work and legacy. After the detention of Muhumusa in August 1917, Nyabinga Kirgiwa was inspired by Muhumusa's and continued in her ways. She organized the Nyakinshayi revolt which had the total support of her people and community. A high bounty was placed on Kirgiwa by the British officials and the people supported her because of her loyalty, love and trust and leadership. As a result, nobody betrayed Kirgiwa or gave her up to the British officials or claimed the bounty. In January 1919, the British forces carried out a great attack on Kirgiwa camp in Congo. They killed most of the men in the camp, but luckily, Kigiwa and the main body of fighters managed to escape. Kigiwa did not allow this stop or discourage her from fighting. She made other attempts to stir up more revolts, but the attack on her was enormous and the British official wanted her dead at all costs. 
to preserve her life and not end up like Muhumusa, she was forced to retreat into the hills, thereby avoiding capture and imprisonment. Queen Amusa Nefertari Queen Amusa Nefertari was the first great royal wife of the 18th dynasty of ancient Egypt. She was a daughter of Sekenre Tao and Ahotep I and royal sister and wife to Amuset I. Her son Amenhotep I became pharaoh and she may have served as his regent when he was young. Amuset Nefertari was deified after her death. She played an outstanding role as an African woman and her contributions to history are immense. Queen Amusen Nefertari was an active participant along with her husband, King Amuse, in the final defeat and ejection from Africa of the hated Hyksos invaders and occupiers. This made her people see her as a national heroine and one of the outstanding figures in African history. Indeed, she was a co-founder of the glorious 18th dynasty of Kemet called the greatest royal family that ever mounted a throne. Queen Amosa Nefertari held many titles, including those of hereditary princess, great of grace, great of praises, king's mother and king's wife, God's wife, united with the white crown, king's daughter and king's sister. However, her preferred title was that of God's wife. Queen Amosa Nefertari was revered as goddess of resurrection and was arguably the most venerated woman in Egyptian history. After her husband's brilliant reign, she ruled the land with her son, King Amenhotep I. Queen Amosa Nefertari was respected, adored and worshipped, a practice that continued for more than 600 years after her death. She appointed a special priesthood who recited in her honor a prayer only used in addressing the pension of the most powerful deities in the land. She was titled God's wife of Ahmed and was a priestess in the National Religious Center in ancient Egypt. It is worthy to mention that the surviving portraits of Amosa Nefertari are all painted in black, a sign further illustrating her great prominence. Madam Yoko or Mami Yoko Madam Yoko was the leader of the Mende people in Sierra Leone. She was born around 1849 in the Bo chiefdom. She was originally called Soma, but she later changed her name to Yoko at a Sunday's initiation ceremony, where she became known for her graceful dancing. Yoko became a leader of considerable influence by combining the valuable lineage, shrewd married choices, and the power afforded her from the secret Sunday society. Madame Yoko expanded the Mende kingdom. She was the ruler of the vast Pa Mende confederacy at the time of her death. Yoko's first marriage to a man named Gongo Ima was unsuccessful. She later married Benje, chief of Taima. Although Yoko remained childless, Benjay made her his great wife, giving her economic power within her household. In 1875, Banya was detained by British colonial officials in Taima Waro following Benjay's death. Yoko married Banya Lango. Yoko went directly to Governor Rowe to appeal for her husband's release. Rowe was impressed with Yoko's appeal and Baya was flogged and then released. Baya made Yoko his great wife following this incident and began sending her on diplomatic missions. Yoko was able to wield significant power not only amongst women but Mende society as a whole with the help of Sande. As a leader in this woman's secret society, she made political alliances and took younger initiates as wards, later marrying them into aristocratic lineages in an imitation of the trajectory 
of her own rise to power. In 1878, following her husband's death, Yoko became the chief of Sehehun. She was officially recognized as Queen of Senehun in 1884. This recognition was not only from her people but also from the British. She was rumored to have committed suicide in 1906. She was succeeded by Lamboy, her brother, as she had no descendants of her own. Carlotta Lukumin Carlotta was born in 1830 and died in 1844. Carlotta Lukumi was a Yoruba woman born in the kingdom of Benin. When she was 10 years old, she was kidnapped from her home and sold into slavery to work on the sugar and cotton plantations in the city of Matanzas, Cuba. Carlotta got the name Lukumi from the feared Afro-Brazilians of Yoruba descent who were famous for rebelling against their masters. Carlotta earned her nickname as the infamous machete-wielding leader of a slave rebellion on the Caribbean island in November 1843. Carlotta broke through the male-dominated legacy of rebel leaders to place herself firmly in history by orchestrating a slave uprising on November 5, 1843. After months of secret planning and organizing, Carlotta and a group of fellow enslaved Africans rose up and toppled Julian Louis Alfonso Sole, mayor of Matanzas and owner of the local sugar mill. The rebel group was made of, of enslaved Africans working on the Trivanto sugar plantation and surrounding plantations. Carlotta and the rebels started by setting houses on fire, specifically those used to drill and torture slaves. The movement spread. She was bright, musical, determined and clever, a fierce and loyal leader. She was killed in November 1844, but her legacy did not die. The news of her death sparked further uprisings in hopes of completing the mission to free enslaved Africans. Such was the loyalty and strength she inspired in people. Nehanda Chawe Nyasikana Nehanda Chawe Nyasikana was a vikiro or spiritual medium of the Zezuru Shona people of Mashona land in the present day northern Zimbabwe. Chawe Nyasikana was considered to be a medium between the spirit and physical realms at the time of birth. Nyasikana was the daughter of Nyatsimba Mutota the first ruler of the state of Munumtapa and was given the title of Nehanda at the time of her birth. The spirit of Nehanda is regarded as an ancestral spirit and physical embodiment of the Nehanda within the cultures of Zimbabwe and South Africa. In the early 1890s, European settlers began to encroach upon the areas of Mashona land. During this time, Nehanda Nyasikana was optimistic about the character of the Europeans. She was unaware of their true intentions. She promoted building relationships with the Europeans, ordered her people not to fear them, and offered them nourishment. In return for the kindness of the Shona-speaking people, the Europeans enforced a hot task. Labor camps and force the people off of their lands. Once she learned the true intentions of the Europeans, her attention turned to ensuring the freedom of her people at all cost. This prompted Ndebele and Shona to lead a revolt or the first Chimurenga War of Liberation in June 1896. Mukwati, a spirit medium, who was considered the spirit of husband of Nehanda, joined Nehanda and Kaguvi to form a third spirit medium. They became the essential voices to rally the people against the whites. Nehanda Nyakskana was captured in 1897 by the Europeans after escaping their grasp for a year. Queen Eden of Great Benin Kingdom 
Queen Eden was the wife of Oba Ewakbi. Ewakbi's reign was characterized by a series of setbacks during the early period, to the extent that all subjects in the kingdom revolted against the monarch's high-handedness and flagrant disrespect of human lives which culminated in the mass killing of his subjects as Uselu during the funeral of his demised mother. The elders and citizens of the kingdom could no longer accommodate the excesses of the king and they suspended all meetings and social services at the palace. Oba Ewakbe's wives, Olois, the royal slaves, Ovien, and other palace attendants also left. Queen Eden alone demonstrated her loyalty and love for her husband by staying with him. She was the pride and embodiment of love, strength, courage, brevity, African beauty, and femininity. Obaiwakbe decided to go to his mother's town, Ikoka, when life in the palace became unbearable. He was disrespected and treated unkindly by his mother's folks that he had to place a curse on the people and the town of Ikoka. He returned to Benin devastated and isolated. Queen Eden decided to consult an oracle to find a solution to her husband's debacle. She was told a human sacrificial lamb was needed to appease the gods. This message aggravated Obaiwakbe as there were no other human being in his palace besides his dear wife. Queen Eden volunteered herself as a sacrificial lamb. Obaiwakbe became nervously bitter as he could not comprehend the possibility of killing his dear wife. Queen encouraged the royal hands to shed her blood to appease the ancestral spirits of the land of Benin. Oba Ewakbe considered reluctantly to the pressure mounted by his faithful queen and sacrificed her to the gods and she was buried alive. Before Queen Eden voluntarily atonement to the gods, she requested that the king should make sure her graveside is kept clean at all times. In addition, she cautioned against any person treading on her grave or else such trespasser should be killed on the spot as a mark of respect for her blessed memory. Her desire was strictly ahead to until the British bloody invasion of Benin in 1897. As soon as Obaiwakbe finished the sacrificial rituals, some of the prominent chiefs of the kingdom called for a truce between the throne and its aggrieved subjects. Other Benin chiefs started paying homage to the Benin monarch again and pledged their loyalty to the bereaved Oba Ewakbe. Then all other Benins came in the same spirit to pledge their allegiance to Oba Ewakbe's authority over them as their king. Consequently, the entire kingdom was reconciled back to the king and remained loyal to the royal majesty till the end of his reign. Queen Eden's sacrifice returned peace, unity, and prosperity to the kingdom. Queen Nzinga Mbande Nzinga Mbande was a great queen of the Ndongo and Matamba kingdom tribes in what is modern-day Angola. She was born circa 1583 and died on December 17, 1663. Queen Nzinga Mbande was known for her great intelligence. She was a strong ruler in the 17th century. She ferociously fought for the freedom of her kingdom against the Portuguese colonizers who colonized the Central African coast at the time and controlled the slave trade of Africans. To increase her military strength and create a strong army, Queen Nzinga offered sanctuary to runaway slaves and Portuguese trained African soldiers. At the time, the kingdom of Ndongo fell into the hands of the Portuguese and was ruled by them. Thus, Queen Nzinga ignited a revolution among the tribe. Her goal was to free Ndongo and take them away from the shackles of the colonial masters. 
Queen Nzinga brokered an alliance with the Dutch against the Portuguese to break the Portuguese stronghold over her people. Unfortunately, this alliance was not sufficient to expel the Portuguese and break their power. Queen Nzinga decided to focus her attention and time on strengthening her trading power and influence by developing the Matamba Kingdom after withdrawing from Mdongo to Matamba. She made Matamba the gateway to the Central African interior for trading. Queen Nzinga died in 1661 at the ripe age of 81 and made Matamba a great and strong kingdom resisting the Portuguese colonization for many years. Her kingdom was only integrated into Angola at the end of the 19th century. Queen Saranoya Mangu Saranoya Mangu was born in the 1800s in what is now the Niger Republic in Africa. An Anza person who were a subgroup of the Hausa who ruled the region in the late 19th century. Saraona was born with yellow eyes like that of a panther and so at the age of 20 when her father died she became queen of the Anza and adopted the panther as a symbol. In the Hausa language Saraonia means queen or female chief. She comes from a lineage of female rulers who exercise both political and religious powers amongst the Aminists Anza people of Logu. Local legend said that Queen Saranoia possessed the supernatural powers of a sorceress. She became one of the most famous Saranoias because of her resistance against French colonial troops at the Battle of Logu in 1899. She was one of the female war leaders, chief and priestess of the Anza subgroup of the Hausa who in 1899 fought French colonial troops of the Volet Chanonoin mission in the Battle of Lugu in present-day Niger. In the late 1800s, Captain Paul Voulet and Juliette Chanonoin led the French Voulet Chanonoin mission of Central African Chad mission to conquer the territories between the Niger River and Lake Chad and unify all French territories in West Africa. Whereas some kingdoms readily collaborated with the French in the hope of finally subduing her and her kingdom, and others capitulated without a fight, she mobilized her people and resources to confront the French forces of the Violet Chenonoin mission, which launched a fierce attack on her fortress capital of Logu. She and her fighters retreated from the fortress, having been overwhelmed by the superior firepower of the French. They engaged the attackers in a protracted guerrilla battle. Saranoia and her people raided the French camp overnight, every night, appearing from the tall grass and disappearing just as quickly. As talk of the Saranoia's magic began making its way through the camp, morale plummeted. The conscripts, who were mostly Africans, often forced into service, began to have fitful nightmares and many deserted. Her heroic efforts eventually forced the French to abandon their project of subduing her. Saranoia Mangu was the subject of the 1986 film Saranoia, based on the novel written by Abdullaye Mamani. Amani Renas Amani Renas was of the Merotiti kingdom of Kush in Northeast Africa, 40 to 10 BC. She was one of the greatest queen mothers, also known as Kadankes. She was queen and ruled over the Meroite kingdom of Kush in Northeast Africa between circa 40 BC to 10 BC. She was a brave ruler and leader who didn't flinch in the face of war to save her kingdom. She and her son, Akinidad led a huge army of 30,000 troops to attack the Roman fort situated in the city of Aswan, Egypt. When the Roman Emperor Augustus levied a tax on the Kushites in 24 BC, this led to the destruction of the statues of Caesar in Elephantine, which was no easy feat at the time. The Roman Emperor was outraged and sought revenge so he sent out General Petronius 
to defeat Amani Renas. The general was met with strong resistance from Amani Renas and her army. The hard battle went on for over three years with no wins on either side. So the two parties agreed to negotiate a peace treaty. The Romans withdrew their army to Egypt and to their fort, gave the land back to the Kushites and rescinded the tax. This was a huge win for Amani Renas. Her doggedness and fierceness made the mighty Roman Empire fail. She was a great warrior that is remembered for her fighting in combat side by side with her soldiers. She suffered a loss of sight in one eye after she was wounded by a Roman soldier. The full extent of the Roman loss and humiliation in the fight against Amirenas and her army is yet unknown because the Kushite account of the war was written in the Meroitic script yet to be fully decoded. Tare Nurara of Emu Bay in Northern Tasmania Tare Nurara was an indigenous Australian leader of the Tomegine people around circa 1800 to 1831. When she was still a teenager, she was kidnapped by the aborigines of the Port Sorrel region and subsequently sold to white settlers on the Bass Strait Islands, where they are called Willa. She was bright, smart and intelligent. She learned how to speak fluent English. She also learned a lot about weapons and the use of firearms. She had a natural talent for picking up technicalities. Tare Nurara was dissatisfied with the occupation and control of the European invaders and the hold they had over her country. Hence, she returned to North Tasmania in 1828. There, she assembled men and women from many bands to combat and fight against the Europeans. She put her knowledge of weapons and firearms into good use by training her followers on how to use firearms and turning them into warriors. She was a tactical and strategic leader and was skilled in the art of subterfuge. She planned an attack on the European invaders when they were at their weakest and most especially between the time their guns were discharged and before they were able to reload. She also knew the importance of food in welfare. So she ordered that the European sheep and bullocks be killed to starve them. G.A. Robinson, who was charged with rounding up the aborigines, was told by sealers that Taranarara would stand on a hill to organize the attack and abuse the settlers. Queen Rana Valona I, 1778 to 1861, Madagascar. Queen Rana Valona I, also known as Ramavo and Ranavalo Manjaka I, was sovereign of the Kingdom of Madagascar from 1828 to 1861. She was nicknamed the Mad Monarch of Madagascar and considered one of the proudest and cruelest women ever on the face of the earth. Following the death of her husband and second cousin Radama I, Rana Valona positioned herself as queen. She pursued a policy of isolationism and self-sufficiency, reducing economic and political ties with European powers repelling a French attack on the coastal town of Foul Point. She took various measures to eradicate the small but growing Malagasy Christian movement initiated under Radama I by members of the London Missionary Society. She made heavy use of the traditional practice of Fanum Poana, forced labor, as tax payment to complete public work projects and develop a standing army of between 20,000 and 30,000 marina soldiers whom she deployed to pacify outlying regions of the island and further expand the realm. The combination of regular warfare, disease, difficult first labor and harsh measures of judge justice resulted in high mortality rate among soldiers and civilians alike during her 33-year reign. Although Rana Vanola policies greatly obstructed the French and British political interests in Madagascar, but the interest remained undiminished. 
the European intermediaries exploited opportunities occasioned by the divisions between traditionalist and pro-European factions at the Queen's Court to hasten the succession of Rana Valorian's son, Radama II. The young prince disagreed with many of his mother's policies and was amenable to French proposals for the exploitation of the island's resources as expressed in the Lambert Charter he concluded with a French representative in 1855. These plans were never successful, however, and Radama II was not to take the throne until 1861, when Rana Valona died aged 83. Rana Valona's European contemporaries generally condemned her policies and characterized her as a tyrant at best and insane at worst. These negative characterizations persisted in foreign scholarly literature until the mid-1970s. Recent academic research has recast Rana Valona's actions as those of a queen attempting to expand her empire while protecting Malagasy sovereignty against the encroachment of European cultural and political influence. Harriet Araminta Ross, also known as the Moses of her people, was born in 1820 and died on March 10, 1913. She was an African-American abolitionist and a political activist. She was enslaved, escaped and helped others gain their freedom as a conductor of the Underground Railroad. Topman was a great humanitarian and served as a scout, spy, guerrilla soldier and nurse for the Union Army during the Civil War. She is considered the first American woman to serve in the military. She was born into slavery, but managed to escape to Philadelphia in 1849 with her two brothers. She later returned to Maryland where her family lived to rescue them. She returned to the South several times and helped dozens of people escape. Her success led slave owners to post a $40,000 reward for her capture or death. She never lost a passenger and was never caught. She participated in other anti-slavery efforts. As a union spy and scout, Tubman often transformed herself into an aging woman. She would wander the streets under Confederate control and learn from the enslaved population about Confederate troop placements and supply lines. Topman helped many of these individuals find food, shelter, and even jobs in the North. She also became a respected guerrilla operative. As a nurse, Topman dispensed herbal remedies to black and white soldiers dying from infection and disease. Eventually, she made more than 19 missions to rescue more than 300 slaves with the help of the network of anti-slavery activists and safe houses popularly referred to as the Underground Railroad. In June 1863, Tubman became the first woman to lead an armed expedition in the Civil War. She guided the Combahee River Raid, which liberated more than 700 enslaved blacks in South Carolina, the largest liberation of enslaved black people in American history. In 1896, she established the Harriet Tubman House for the aged. On land near her home, Tubman died in 1913 and was buried with military honors at Fort Hill Cemetery in Auburn, New York. Makari Hatshepsut Makari Hatshepsut began her reign circa 1500 BC in what was a 20-year reign of the impressive female monarch ever seen in history. She ruled close to the height of ancient Egypt's power and reign. That period was known as the Golden Age in the long history of the African people. There was great internal stability during that era and a time of astounding international prestige. In her time as monarch, 
Hatshepsut's most impressive feat was her travels and grand voyage to the African land of Punt, which the people of Kamites called God's land because of the great riches and abundance the land and people of Punt possessed. The land of Punt was in the Horn of Africa, consisting of some parts of Somalia, Eritrea and even Yemen across the Red Sea in the Arabian Peninsula. Travelling to Punt at the time was seen as a huge accomplishment for the monarchs of Kemet. Makari Hatshepsut was one of Africa's greatest women and monarchs. The famous procession of Makari Hatshepsut with the king and queen of Punt, Perahu and Eti was on the walls of Hatshepsut's mortuary temple located at Deir el Bari. The original portrayal is now located in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. Makare Hatshepsut's royal titles included King of the North and South, Son of the Sun, the Heru of Gold, Bestower of Years, Goddess of Risings, Conqueror of All Lands, Lady of Both Lands, Vivifier of Years, Chief Spouse of Amen, the Mighty One. She had a daughter, Princess Nefeure, who was raised by the steward Senemut. There are various statues of Senemut in existence that include the head of Princess Neferure emerging. Neferure has the titles King's Daughter and God's Wife. Perpetua and Felicity Perpetua and Felicity were two brave African women whose act of martyrdom was so popular that their deaths were known as the martyrdom of Perpetua and Felicity. The event of their death occurred in the year 203 CE. The first known Christian martyrs of Africa started in 180 CE. Perpetua was a well-read, vivacious and intelligent young lady. At age 22 and with a nursing infant baby, she became a Christian in the year 203 CE. She got baptized into the Christian faith. This was a very risky thing to do at that time and she knew how dangerous it was and how it could lead to her eventual death. But she wasn't deterred or swayed. Her family was worried for her, most especially her father. He warned her of the dangers of taking up the Christian faith and tried to persuade her to desist from it. When she was eight months pregnant, Perpetua was arrested alongside Felicity, another African woman. The condition of the prison was terrible and the heat unbearable. She suffered greatly in prison, but that didn't dampen her vigor in her belief or faith. She continued to show strength, fearlessness in her faith and strong leadership that even the prison officers were enraptured by her and the power she exuded. So much so the prison warden converted to Christianity. The day of their execution was converted into a feast and a public spectacle to shame the matters and to dissuade anyone else from converting to Christianity. The crowd gathered to watch and laughed at the matters to humiliate them. But matters just laughed back and refused to be shamed. Animals such as bears, leopards and wild boars were brought in to attack the male matters while the African women matters were stripped naked to face a wild cow. Perpetua, who had just given birth, had milk flowing from her breast. The gathered crowd were horrified and couldn't watch the spectacle. This didn't save Perpetua and Felicity as they were thrown roughly and brutally back into the arena. Regardless of her pain and suffering, Perpetua, filled with compassion and still thinking of others, went to help Felicity to her feet. The two then stood side by side, dignity intact, held, held raised high as all the matters assembled in the arena and had their throats cut. Perpetua and Felicity were later canonized as saints 
and their bravery is still recognized today. Dia or Kahina, Algeria. Dia or Kahina, also called Al Kahina, was born in modern day Algeria. She succeeded Caecilius as a warrior queen, religious, and military leader of the Berber tribes in the 1680s. Some Arab historians claimed she was a Jewish sorcerer and had a gift of prophecy. Her long hair or great size is regarded by several oral legends as both legendary characteristics of sorcerers. Tie of Egypt, Egypt. Tie, also known as Te, was the queen of Egypt of the 18th dynasty. She was the wife of Pharaoh Amenhotep III, mother of Akhenaten, and grandmother of both Tutankhamun and Aksenamun. Tie had great influence and held sway at the courts of both her husband and son. She is said to have communicated directly with rulers of foreign nations. Queen Tia's son, Amenhotep IV, also known as Akhenaten, is one of the most significant figures in all human history. Her grandson, Tutankhamen, is arguably the most famous king to emerge from the ancient world. Such is the importance of Tia in human history. There are many ceremonial records of Amenhotep III that shows the powers and high capabilities of Quintille in respect to her husband. She was highly skilled in matters of the state. She was a tactical strategist who had a great influence on how her husband ruled his kingdom. She played a massive role and was an integral part of state's affairs. In more than one instance, Foreign sovereigns appeal to her directly in matters of international importance. Tia is a very popular figure when it comes to the history of love and romance. She got married to Amenhotep III at a very young age. Their romance and love have been much talked about in history. A massive statue of Amenhotep III and Tia was erected and placed in the temple of Medinet Habu in Luxor, Egypt. It depicts such a level of love, adoration and respect that they had for each other that cannot be said of any other statue found in history. Tia has been vastly illustrated and described in many works. She is often shown with her full distinct African features. Many of her depictions are in museums in New York City, Paris, Brussels, and Berlin. Indeed, there are probably more depictions of Queen Tia than any African woman from ancient times. Hyopatia of Alexandria Hyopatia is said to have been born around 360 CE and died in March 415 CE. She was the daughter of Theon, the last known mathematician associated with the Museum of Alexandria. She was a scholar of great repute and an intellectual teacher. She is often regarded as the world's first woman mathematician and one of the most interesting personalities from the world of antiquity. Apart from lecturing mathematics, she also lectured in philosophy and astronomy which no other woman of that time did. She was indeed a pioneer for women and a legend. Mathematics has a long and distinguished tradition in Africa. She pioneered the mathematical tradition passed down to the Greeks of the Academy of Athens. In the days Hyopatia lived, the Romans ruled and controlled Egypt and there was a Christian group that believed women should not have the knowledge that Hyopatia did. They felt it was an abomination and blasphemy for a woman to indulge in philosophy and astronomy 
and so a mob was formed to kill her. The mob succeeded in killing Hyapasha in the streets of Alexandria. Nathotep Nathotep, meaning the goddess Neith is satisfied, was born circa 3200 BCE. She is known as the first queen of Kemet in ancient Egypt and co-founder of the first dynasty. She is the earliest African queen whose name is known in African history. Some historians ascribe to her the position of a sort of godmother of Kemet, the greatest nation in the ancient world. Natotep was married to King Nama. This union represented the start of the early dynastic period of Kemet and the unification of the two lands of Lower and Upper Kemet, later known as Egypt. Nathotep's name was found in several locations, particularly at ancient Nakada and in the general vicinity at the site of the royal tombs in Umm al Kab. Her titles were foremost of women and consort of the two ladies. Both were titles given to queens during the first dynasty of Kemet. Amina Sukera. In the 16th century, a ruthless warrior named Queen Amina commanded an army of 20,000 men in what is now northern Nigeria. Queen Amina was formerly called Amina Sukera. She was a princess of Zazao in modern day Zaria, northern Nigeria. Amina is an Arabic name which means truthful, trustworthy, and honest. Amina was born around 1533 in Zaria. She was the daughter of Bakwa of Turunku. Her family's wealth was derived from the trade of leather goods, cloth, collar, salt, horses and imported metals. Amina grew up in her grandfather's court and was favoured by him. He carried her around the court and instructed her carefully in political and military matters. This built up her interest in all things military and war, things that were mostly of male interest in that era. After the death of her parents around 1566, Amina's brother became the king of Zazao. At this point, Amina had distinguished herself as a leading warrior in her brother's cavalry and gained notoriety for military skills. She is still celebrated today in traditional Hausa praise songs as Amina, daughter of Nikatao, a woman as capable as the man that was able to lead men to war. After the death of her brother Karami in 1576, Amina ascended to the position of queen. Zazao was one of the original seven Hausa states, Hausa Bakwai. The others being Daura, Kano, Gobir, Katsina, Rano, and Garun Gabas. Before Amina assumed the throne, Zazao was one of the largest of these states. Within three months of being made a queen, Amina proceeded to start a 34-year-long war to enlarge the territory which she ruled over. Her army consisting of 20,000 foot soldiers and a thousand cavalry troops was well trained and fearsome. One of her first announcements to her people was a call for them to sharpen their weapons. She was a brave and fearsome queen and ruled with a firm hand. Queen Amina is a legend among the Hausa people for her military exploits. She was warlike and captured and controlled even more territories than her father and brother who ruled before her. After gaining control of a new city, she would erect ethan walls around them to protect and mark the cities. The ethan walls became so popular that they stayed up, up until the British forces conquered Zazao in 1904 and many of those walls survive to date. They are famously called Gunwa Amina, Amina's walls. A statue of Queen Amina 
was created at the National Arts Theatre in Lagos, Nigeria, to honor her and numerous educational institutions bear her name. Mekatilili Wamenza or Makatilili. Mekatilili Wamenza was born in the 1860s at the Mutsara Watatsu in Ba, Mba, Kenya. She was an independent activist that led the Giriyama People's Rebellion against the British colonial administration and policies between 1913 and 1914. The Giriyama people belong to the Mijikendes people subgroup that dwells in the Kenyan coast. They dwell in sacred places called Kayas, which is located in forested areas. Mekatilili grew up in a patrilineal Giriyama community where women rarely hold leadership positions. Mekatilili was distressed by the erosion of traditional Giriyama culture by the British colonial masters. The British colonial administration blew up and destroyed Kayafungo, one of their sacred places. This caused Mekatilili Wamenza to lead a rebellion against them. As a widow, Mekatilili had certain privileges accorded to her to speak before the elders. She was able to gather together support for her cause against the colonial authorities using her strong traditional religious beliefs. She was assisted by Wanjewa Mwadori Kola, a traditional medicine man. She was able to attract large followings through her performance of the Kifudu dance, which was reserved for funeral ceremonies. Mekatilili persistently performed this dance from town to town, attracting a large following. She was eventually captured by the British on 17th October 1913 and exiled to Kisi in Nyanza province in Mumias in Western province. British colonial records show that she returned to her native area five years later and continued to oppose the imposition of colonial policies and ordinances. She died in 1924. Wangu Wamakeri Wangu Wamakeri was the first female chief of colonial Kenya. Wangu Makeri was of Ndobo descent and was from the Etaga clan. She was born around 1856 to Gatuika Macheria and Wakeru of Gitie village in Kangema division, Muranga district. She had no formal education. In 1901, she was appointed the headman of Waitaga location and the first and only female headman of the entire colonial period. She was a hard-working iron lady, but also harsh and fierce like a lion, particularly to men. Wango became famous for riding on the backs of able-bodied tax evaders as people cheered. She was hated for her rootlessness. While people sat on stools under the Mugomo tree discussing serious issues, Wangu will refuse to sit on a stool and insist that a man kneels on all fours so she could sit on his back. Men's bags acted as a seat as she lords over both men and women, dispensing the white man's decrees and collecting taxes. A story is told of how Wangu once addressed a baraza sitting on the back of a drunkard who had tried to disrupt her meeting. Wangu is said to have committed the ultimate insult against tradition and her colonial office after she allegedly danced Kibata, an exclusive adult male dance, naked. Seeing her hero and lover dancing with youth and vigor, Wangu threw caution to the wind, discarded some of her clothing and exposed her breasts as she provocatively danced, clutching Karuri. She stood up and flung herself on the dance floor and began to dance vigorously, exposing her breasts and thighs, leading to her downfall. Some historians argued that she participated in the dance to challenge discrimination of women based on Kenyan's traditions and to prove that what a man can do, a woman can also do. In June 1909, Wangu was forced to resign based on her dishonorable dance, ending her decade-long reign of terror. 
Wangu became the subject of ridicule and discussion among the people she ruled. Her office still stands at Koimbi Trading Center. There is a small cell where she is reputed to have whipped every man while seated on the backs of other men. Charlotte Magzeke Ni Mania Charlotte Magzeke was born at Ramukgopa in Polokwane district, then Petersburg district, Limpopo. She was the daughter of John Kigope Mania, the son of Hedman Mudidima Mania from Balotkwa people, under chief Mamafa Ramukgopa and Anamansi, a Zosa woman from Fort Beaufort. She was a social worker, South African religious leader and political activist. In 1894, Charlotte Maya joined a choir that went on tour to Canada and the United States and was offered a scholarship to study at Wilberforce University in Wilberforce, Ohio. While at Wilberforce, she married Marshall Magzeki. She graduated with a Bachelor of Science degree in 1901. She became the first black South African woman to receive a colored degree. She and her husband returned to South Africa and founded the Wilberforce Institute. Charlotte became politically active while in the African Methodist Episcopal Church, in which she played a part in bringing to South Africa. The church later elected her president of the Women's Missionary Society. While in the AME Church, Magzeke was heavily involved in teaching and preaching the gospel and advocating education of South Africans. Shortly after her return to South Africa in 1902, Magzeke began her involvement in anti-colonial politics. She, along with two other individuals from Transvaal, attended an early South African Native Nationals Congress meeting and was one of the few women present. Magzeke attended the formal launch of the South African Native National Congress in Bloemfontein in 1912. Magzeke also became active in the movement against past laws through her political activities. During the Bloemfontein and the past campaign, Magzeke served as an impetus towards eventual protest by organizing women against the past laws. In 1919, she was active in the anti-past laws demonstrating, which led her to found the Bantu Women's League, which later became part of the African National Congress Women's League. She died at the age of 68 in Johannesburg, South Africa. Fumilayo Ransom Kuti Fumilayo Ransom Kuti was born Francis Abigail Olufumilayo Thomas. She was a teacher, political campaigner, women's rights activist, and traditional aristocrat. She served with distinction as one of the most prominent leaders of her generation. History perceives her as the first female Nigerian political activist. Ransom Kuti's political activism led to her being described as the doyen of female rights in Nigeria, as well as her being regarded as the mother of Africa. She was an exceptionally powerful politician who pushed for women's rights in Nigeria. The West African pilot depicted this lady as the lioness of Lisabi. She was the mother of the activist Fela Anikula Kokuti, the famous musician Beko Ransom Kuti, a doctor, and Professor Olukoye Ransom Kuti, a doctor and a former health minister of Nigeria. She was also grandmother to musicians Shionkuti and Femikuti. She was the first woman in Nigeria to drive a car. Early on, she was a very powerful force advocating for the Nigerian woman's right to vote or suffrage. She was described in 1947 by the West African pilot as the Lioness of Lisabi for her leadership of the women of the Egba clan that she belonged to on a campaign against the arbitrary taxation. That struggle led to the application of the Egba High King of Bademola II in 1949. Lilian Masedibe 
Matabane Ngoi was a South African anti-apartheid activist, ENC member who helped launch the Federation of South African Women. She was the first woman elected to the Executive Committee of the African National and President of the Women's League. On August 9, 1956, she led a women's march along with Helen Joseph, Raima Musa, Sophia Williams de Bruyne, Mutlali Pula Chabaku, Beta Xowa, and Albertina Sisulu of 20,000 women to the union's building of Pretoria in protest against the apartheid government requiring women to carry passbooks as part of the pass laws. Ngoyi was a transnational figure who recognized the potential influence of international support for the struggle against apartheid and the emancipation of black women. With this in mind, she set out on an audacious and highly illegal journey to Lausanne, Switzerland in 1955 to participate in the World Congress of Mothers held by the Women's International Democratic Federation, WIDF. She embarked on a journey that would see an attempt to stow away on a boat leaving Cape Town under white names with the help of a sympathetic pilot, segregated seating on a plane bound for London and gained entry to Britain under the pretext of completing her course in Bible studies. She visited England, Germany, Switzerland, Romania, China and Russia, meeting women leaders often engaged in left-wing politics before arriving back in South Africa, a wanted woman. Ngoyi was known as a strong orator and was a fierce inspiration to her colleagues in the ANC. She was arrested in 1956, spent 71 days in solitary confinement and was for a period of 11 years placed under severe bans and restrictions that often confined her to her home in Orlando, Soweto. The Kus Bukus Clinic at the Chris Annie Baragwanath Hospital in Soweto has been renamed Lilian Ngoyi Community Clinic in her honor. On November 16, 2004, the South African Ministry of the Environment launched the first vessel in a class of environmental patrol vessels named the Lilian Ngoyi in her honor. On August 9, 2006, the 50th anniversary of the March on Pretoria, Stridom Square from which the women marched was renamed Lilian Ngoyi Square. In 2009, a residence hall at Rhodes University was named, renamed in her honor. In 2012, Van the World Street in Pretoria was renamed Lilian Ngoyi Street. The city of Johannesburg decided to honor Lilian Masadibe Ngoyi by renaming the Bree Street in Johannesburg after her in 2014. The street named Lilian Ngoyi Street. Empress Zuditu, April 29. 1876 to April 2nd, 1930, Ethiopia. Empress Yuditu of Ethiopia was born on April 29, 1876 as Askala Miriam in the city of Hara in Ngesa Goro province, Ethiopia. Zoditu or Zauditu was Empress of Ethiopia from 1916 to 1930. She was the first female head of an internationally recognized state in Africa in the 19th and 20th centuries and the first empress regent of the Ethiopian Empire, perhaps since the legendary Makeda, the Queen of Sheba. She patterned her reign after British Queen Victoria, whom she admired, nonetheless soon clashed with Tafari Makonen, who wanted to modernize Ethiopia. Her reign was noted for the reforms of her regent and designated heir, Rastafari Makonen, 
who succeeded her as Emperor Haile Selassie I, about which she was at best ambivalent and often stridently opposed due to her staunch conservatism and strong religious devotion. Zuditu was also the last empress regent in world history. The early period of Zuditu's reign was marked by a war against Lij Iyasu, who had escaped captivity. One of our heroines, Adelaide Casely Hayford. Adelaide Smith Casely Hayford was a Victorian feminist who dedicated her life to the education of girls in Syria alone. Born on June 2, 1868 in Freetown, Sierra Leone, Casely Hayford was the second youngest of seven children of parents, William Smith Jr. and Anne Spilbury. She was a Sierra Leonean Creole advocate, an activist for cultural nationalism, educator, short story writer and feminist. She was the second youngest of her parents' seven children. The ideas of racial pride and cooperation advanced by Marcus Garvey's Universal Negro Improvement Association, UNIA, inspired her to join the ladies' division of the Freetown branch and rose to be its president. She established a school for girls in Sierra Leone, 1923, to instill cultural and racial pride. She promoted the preservation of Sierra Leone national identity and cultural heritage. She wore a traditional African costume to attend a reception in honor of the Prince of Wales in 1925, where she created a sensation. She returned to England, where she opened a boarding home for African bachelors who were there as students or workers together with her sister. She established a vocational institution to help girls learn their cultural background and instill national pride back in Freetown. She toured the United States, giving public lectures to correct American notion about Africa. She died in Freetown in 1960, aged 91.